Glorify thy 
Amen. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful Labor Day weekend and I uh, hope you have great plans with your families this evening and tomorrow. It's good to see each one of you this morning. Um, our message today is coming from the book of Titus, a little, a smaller book, a little book in the back of your New Testament. If you want to be opening your Bibles there, chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Um, we want to begin this morning with a time of prayer for some needs that are among us and want you to be praying for those you are aware of and for one another. Uh, Brother Joe is not able to be with us and has had a very difficult week. And so I ask you, if you would, to be remembering him in your prayers. It's good to have Brother Charles with us, uh, but always be praying for Brother Charles as he's uh, in uh, frail health and things are difficult right now. We have others that are gone today for, uh, for various reasons, and we want to pause for a moment to pray for them. I also want to share an announcement with you. Uh, next Sunday evening, our Connect groups are starting next Sunday evening, but you're all meeting here next Sunday evening. Got it? So we all come together, your leaders, those of you that are in a Connect group, Everything next Sunday morning, your books and your little sign-up list so that your Connect group leader knows who is coming to their groups are going to be there. I think I counted 10 Connect groups that we have um, when you count our student ministry because the Lord has provided us a great resource that also had student materials of the same thing that the parents are going to be studying. And so I ask you to be in prayer um, about that. But next Sunday morning, you'll pick up your book. You'll sign up for your Connect Group leader. Next Sunday evening, we'll meet in here, introduce that, and then we're off to the races. Everybody ready for that? Yes. Amen. Looking forward to it and looking forward to our fall. Um, as has been shared, we're going to be teaching the children and so those of you that aren't plugged into a connect group and maybe child care is a concern, well, you're entrusting your children to me. And I'm very capable. I've taught children how to eat dog food. Um, I have, I've taught them, yeah. I mean, I've shown them how they, healthy teeth and healthy gums. I mean, you can't. Uh, but I want you to know we're concerned for the spiritual care of your children as well as for you. If you want to be involved in a connect group, please do so. Bring the kids here, then head to one of our nearby connect groups, okay? And uh, we'll share more details with you about that. These needs that are present, and I know that there are many, there are others that are on my heart as well, pertaining to my immediate family, and I know that some of you have those in your families as well. And we want to bring those now before the throne of God so that our hearts will be focused on worship of him today, trust of him, because we're going to talk about this great gospel, the great gospel that has saved us and also preserves for us every promise that is ours in Christ, and that is that God is able to take care of all of our needs in Christ Jesus. So let's go before his throne of grace in prayer right now with, with those concerns. Father, our last song was the prayer that you would glorify your name. You thundered from heaven when your own son prayed that prayer to glorify your name and it thundered, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. As we have that statement in scripture, I pray, Lord, today in accordance with every need that is present in this place that you would be glorified in the hearts of your people by their faith that you are a God who answers prayer and according to his will, all that pleases us happens to glorify you. So today, Lord, whatever those are, whoever they are, whatever it may be arising from, I ask, Father, that we would be able to set those things not aside, 
but to bring them before you, to trust you with them, Father, that you would give us wisdom and direction from your word today, encouragement in the gospel and instruction in righteousness. Father, for our two brothers that I have named this morning, we pray with all of the affections that is reserved for them in this body. We ask you, Lord, to to bless our brothers with your with your holy presence, with your powerful hand and your outstretched arm. And today I ask you to guide us in the study of your word. We thank you for it, and we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand together with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is the word of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You may be seated. In my mind, I wanted to introduce our study in 1 Peter with a series of messages that show the uniform message of holiness that is throughout the Bible, the commanding and commending us to lives of holiness and the teaching on sanctification. In fact, kind of in the, in the way that, that I would like to see this engineered into uh, the fabric of our conversation, our connect groups are going to be talking about sanctification. This is what we're looking at. It's what, what real life and real change is going to present, and that is to pursue the Lord with our whole heart, to love him with our whole heart. And so this morning in that last message before we begin our study in, sec- in First Peter next week, I want us to remember our reason to pursue holiness. We could have chosen several texts of the New Testament, uh, several books of the New Testament that we could have chosen to address this subject. But I think that what we have in these verses in Titus is sufficient, one, because of its brevity, and two, because of its clarity. It is dense and rich with gospel truth for us. Have you ever inherited a mess? I mean, somebody... Uh, gave you the gift of a horse and you didn't inspect the mouth, you know, you, you, never, you never do that, you know. You don't look a gift horse in the mouth uh, if you've not ever heard that saying. Uh, well, I was never given a gift horse. What am I doing using that saying, right? Uh, but, but it's saying just never, never examine something very closely that's been given to you. Don't try and find flaws for it. But chances are if you've received many things at all, um, you have found that, uh, that there are always, there's always some maintenance required. You know, if we look at the big things in our life, the, the big decisions that we make, marriage, for instance, we enter it with bliss. But if your marriage has lasted very long, it's lasted because there's been some work. Uh, you, you have to exercise some work. And, and both our marriage and our families require a great deal of our time and our energy. When we make major purchases, I mean, you know, land or houses or, or vehicles or equipment, all of us know that those possessions are coming to us with the requirement of maintenance of some kind. 
Even the career that we enter. We may enter a career naively, but we are always good to be reminded the reason why we were hired is somebody wasn't doing that job. There's something that you've got to do and nobody else was doing it before you. And it may require that we clean a mess. The truth is the largest pursuits of our life always come at the high price tag of maintenance. Marriage is not going to be its best without work. Your properties and stuff are not going to maintain themselves And you're not going to earn a living by just waiting for somebody to cut you a check every single week so you can pay your bills. It's going to require work. It will take effort. Titus is an interesting book for us in respect to that thought. Because it begins with the reminder of the very thing that we need to do for gospel ministry. Ministry is work. When Paul begins this letter, if you'll look back if it's open, if not, it's on the screen. In verse 5 of the first chapter, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. That's a, that's a verse that is very dense with instruction. I sent you there, and this is what I directed you to do. And he gives him the activities. When we hear this, we're going to hear this continuously said in ministry. Leadership development is key. In fact, that's what we're facing on all fronts of ministry, and you're facing that in all fronts of organization. Whatever your business is, whatever your career is, we all know that it's it's hinged on the ability to develop leaders. When Paul sent Titus, he was commissioned to identify qualified men and then to put them in a place where they will lead, spiritually lead, the churches of Crete. But the other, and what we see in that verse, and the first commission that the Lord gave to him was this, to put what remains into order. Now, now that's encouraging. Put what remains into order. It gets more encouraging the more versions of the Bible, the more translations that you read. Uh, King James said, set in order the things that are wanting. And the New International Version says, put in order the things that were left unfinished. Every way you look at this means that, Titus, I have sent you to a task that needs to be completed. It needs to be tended to. We get the point here, right? Titus was arriving somewhere where there was a mess, and Titus's occupation was going to be, you need to clean this up. I'm sending you for the task. I want us to hear that carefully, because it does get to the root of what we do in ministry. It gets to the root of the ministry of the whole church, not, not just your pastor, not just those preachers and deacons that the church has recognized, not just your teachers, but every single one of us, if we are members of this church and members of the body of Christ, we have this this profession before us. The ministry is the ministry of sanctification, exhorting each other to live a holy life. The constant call to God's people is a call to holiness. We call sinners who are dead in their unrighteousness and sin to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved, to to come alive in Christ. And then those who are redeemed, we constantly call and make aware, don't yield our members to sin, but yield them to righteousness and live for the Lord. In this last message, before we begin looking at Peter's call to holiness of this population of people that inhabited um, the uh, Mediterranean world, we want to give our own careful consideration for our reason for preaching on, ministering in, and also striving for personal holiness. A simple uh, abbreviated sentence for us is that our greatest persuasion for holiness 
is rehearsing the whole gospel. If, if I have to convince us in any way, it's not going to be best accomplished by me getting up here with some quips and quotes and some attaboys, girls. It is going to be by pointing us to Christ for us to give heed to the gospel. Why? Well, the first thing that I see in what we have read this morning is this, that the gospel has brought everyone who believes an equal reward. He says in verse 11 that the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. The gospel was not left for us in words alone. Christmas really happened. I say that and I actually amended that this morning. Because I was curious. This is what I know about this passage or what I remember. My second sermon I ever preached, I preached at um, First Baptist Church in Damascus, Arkansas, uh, and it was from this text. And I was curious because 30 years in ministry, I know I've preached several messages, and the last time I preached from this passage was on Christmas Sunday in 2019. And, and at that time, it was a Christmas meditation. But what do we have? What is said here is about the incarnation, ultimately. It is talking about that the gospel was not just given to us in words. God did not limit it to words. He brought it to us in Jesus Christ. He brought it to us in the person of his only son. The grace has appeared. Every promise of Christ and his coming, every promise of Christ and his sacrificial death and his sufferings, all of those were fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. We have the gospel before us that has appeared for everyone so that while you and I read the word of God, we read the word of God just as the apostles were preaching in those first years of the church, everything is pointing back to Jesus Christ. I preach knowing that my Redeemer lives. You worship today and, and believe and live, I pray, knowing that your Redeemer lives. Preaching in all centuries is based on one peculiar certainty, and that's the certainty of the person of Jesus Christ. Paul, whenever he's giving this encouragement to Titus and how he's going to conduct his ministry before all people, he does this by first pointing him to the gospel of grace that you and I have. That gospel was not just left in words, but has appeared, and also it was not confined to one person, but it's given to everyone. It has appeared to all people, bringing salvation to all people. Now, this is an interesting thing because the grace is bringing salvation to everyone. The reward of grace, salvation, is equal for all. Beginning this chapter... Paul begins by telling Titus, as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Grace is something that ministers to the preacher. Titus was to be a preacher of righteousness. You look in verse 2, old men are told to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, and sound in faith and in love. They were given instruction. You continue to read through those verses, old women are given instruction, young women are given instruction, young men are given instruction, and then servants are given instruction. Everybody that has a job, everybody of all ages is told there is instruction in the gospel of Jesus Christ for everyone. Every single person has the reward of the gospel presented to them because of the person of Jesus Christ. That's why whenever it comes to what our great desire is here, to bring the emphasis to why preach this instruction in holiness, this instruction for daily living, it is that encouragement that it is ultimately applicable for everyone. Look, we're in a day of 12-step self-helping death. I mean, we can, we can focus on every single problem. 
I could get up here today and I could find the latest book on a subject that may or may not apply to you. I may be talking about financial stewardship. And some of you may agree with my points but say, Pastor, I've been a pretty good steward with my finances. I could get up here and I could preach on marriage. And some of you may hear and say those principles are good, but Pastor, I have a pretty good marriage. We could do that in several areas of life, and, and we could lose ourselves in that. But when we preach, church, the reason we exist is for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which applies to everyone and in all circumstances. It, it, it saves us in all of those things. So whenever Paul says this, he says it elsewhere, like in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He, he saw that the application was not just for those who had knowledge of God's revelation, Old Testament revelation, but it was for everyone who would hear the gospel and believe. The second thing that we can observe here is that the gospel presents for us the same expectations. The same expectations are given to all believers in the gospel. In verse 12 and 13, I'll read them again, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have two things that are presented to us. The first one is that God's people live with the expectation of holiness. This, this is nothing new. It is something we must constantly drive at. It's the point of preaching that we are always wanting to win in the battle against sin and the flesh and the devil. We must recognize that it is the expectation of this present age, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live in such a way in this present age, he says. What is it that our ministry in the gospel, what, are, what is it supposed to address? I believe that we have two prohibitions given to us here and then three expectations that are given to us. The prohibitions against ungodliness and against worldly lust. Other translations, worldly passions, worldly desires. What do we have presented to us here? Whatever would not delight the heart of God or be delighted in God for his own glory that that's something that we must deny. And also, whatever the world desires that does not direct the heart toward the worship of God, that is something that must be denied. Child of God, do you find this a struggle? Can we admit that this is a universal struggle for all of us? That I would wake up every single day and my heart, my affections would be rested solely on things that are going to glorify God? Do we ever give ourselves to ungodly pursuits where what we're really pursuing, we're giving very little thought of how this is going to glorify God and what I am doing? There's the challenge, isn't it? To just live for this life alone? To just live for the, the provision and stores of the things of this world? There's, there's one thing that can distract us, and they don't have to be bad things. But am I seeking God's glory in them is the question. And then the other is worldly passions, desires, or lusts. However, your uh, English translation may have that. All of them point us to things that are, are looking to the flesh, looking to sinful desires of the present age. What do we have in these two particular instructions? First, we have an exercise of repentance. And the second is reasoned by faith. I turn away from things or desire in my heart to turn away from those things that are not going to bring glory to God or our pursuits of worldly passions. 
And then because of Christ, I want to give myself to those expectations of soberness, righteousness, and godliness. God's people are commanded. It's expected of us to be holy, but also we are commended. We're commended to expectant hopefulness. So first is instruction against sin, and second is a reminder of our reward. In verse 13, looking for or waiting for our blessed hope, <clears throat> the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why, why is Paul so adamant with Titus about this message of holiness? Paul sees the struggle himself in, uh, in Ephesians, or excuse me, Ephesians. That was the title of the book I just flipped to. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He, he, he presses on because he knows it's not mine yet, but I want to make it mine. And the reason I want to make it mine is because Christ has made me his. Whenever, whenever Paul gives this instruction, he doesn't leave it with just the instruction in righteousness and the call to repentance and the pointing out of error. But the reason is that there is a day that is coming, an expectant day. We must recognize that we have the present age, but also in our minds and in our hearts is thoughts on the day that is to come, the age that's to come. The blessed hope is the anticipation of the fulfillment of final grace. I don't have everything that I know I'm going to have in Christ right now. It, it all is mine, but, but today I know the world that I struggle in, the pains that we observe in one another and the effects of, of sin in our world. But brothers and sisters, one day, one day we're going to have that future and final grace met in the courtroom of heaven and we're going to enter our rest you see, we look forward to that day, waiting for our blessed hope, living and desiring, not that I would finally reach my comfort in this world and be pacified by the things around me, but that the one thing that is going to satisfy my soul is to see Christ. That's what the scripture points us to. Our blessed hope is what? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't it a neat turn on words? Because in this, in this very nugget of, of Titus chapter 2... He says, first, the grace of God has appeared, pointing us to the cross. And now he says, the grace of God will appear, pointing us to the return of Christ. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this is what is going to be the final rest of our souls in the gospel. Grace has appeared and grace will appear. And the whole of it, brothers and sisters, is the grace of God that we have received in the gospel. And that brings us to a final thought of reflecting on the whole work of Christ. And reflecting on the whole work of Christ is our motivation. That motivation to holiness is this reflection, what has been done and what will be done. This sentence that we have is pregnant with great meaning for us in the whole work of Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness 
and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You know, um, this sentence is almost a complete summary of the book of Exodus. The redemption that God gave to his people to set aside a people who would be a, a peculiar possession, his own possession. It's what was done at the cross. It's what's accomplished by the blood of Christ. It, it points to us some profound truths about our Savior. His deity is shown to us. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, immediately preceding this verse, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. There, there was no question about the doctrine of the Trinity in the theology of Paul. Jesus Christ is God, is our Savior. It also highlights for us his saving work. His saving work was that he gave himself, just like in the Exodus, at the end of chapter 2, when the people's cry comes up to the Father, he heard their prayers, remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he heard his people with compassion. We see the work that God has done, and we see the saving work of Christ in giving himself, hearing our cry, and saving us redeeming us from all lawlessness. Not only do we see his saving work, but we see his sovereign work. He has exercised his strength, redeeming us from all lawlessness and purifying to himself a people for his own possession. He gives according to his own demands. Whenever the Lord saves us, redeems us, purchases us by his blood. And that's where we come to the whole of preaching. The whole of preaching. When Titus was exhorted in the task of putting what remains into order, how is that going to be done? What is the ultimate exercise of it? It's preaching. It's the task that has been given to us, church, not just to me, but to us, to faithfully preach his word and to faithfully hear his word. Book by book, chapter by chapter, sentence by sentence and word by word, we preach. Why? Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. What does our preaching do? It relays the fact, it exhorts, commands, encourages by the fact, so we, we speak what is true, we call one another to respond to what is true, and then rebuking with all authority is correcting according to what is true. You see, the, the whole effort of ministry is accomplished by us hearing the word of God and responding accordingly, whether with the joy of faith and the comfort of what has been given us in instruction or according to the instruction to see the error of our ways and to return to Christ. But it's a call to everyone. Let no one disregard you. How does it close? It closes with the call to respect biblical preaching. Brother Cliff Johnson, in his uh, doctoral work, is, I think he's preached a couple of revivals for you all, or, or maybe one in the years past. Brother Cliff did his research on being expositional hearers. In other words, he, he was writing on preaching but he was writing on how we listen to preaching. Do we hear? Do we hear with an expectation that we're going to be given something to obey? Are we given instruction in righteousness? And if so, when we hear the word spoken and hear its exhortation, do I find where I am in error and long to be corrected in Christ? It's a call to all of us, 
Because let no one disregard you. Why? There's a tragedy there. The one who despises a biblical message delivered for our correction and instruction in righteousness, the one who despises biblical preaching is despising the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we despise the gospel of Jesus Christ, we despise Christ. And if you despise Christ, what blood is there on this earth that can save you from your sins? What, what work has been done that can ever bring us salvation? There is nothing left if we don't have Christ. Let no one despise you leads to the further instruction of the book that we'll not labor into this morning, but calls us to the command that we are receiving this instruction in righteousness to turn to him so that God will be glorified in the gospel of Christ by lives that have been transformed by that gospel.